Good morning. Hello, you guys. It is time for the sermon notes. Um, this is actually from my uh, Sunday morning church service. Um, so I'm going to share those notes with you from my Sunday church service from yesterday. Today is Monday, Veterans Day, so I'm sorry I'm a day late. But um, I was out still celebrating my birthday with some plans with my family. So, all right, this is great. Get ready. All right, this is from Daniel chapter 3. And this was basically from the um, Daniel <clears throat> um, and the boys that were, it was actually Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That wasn't their original names, but once they got captured, um, Nebu, King Nebuchadnezzar changed their names. So, that's why I say you got to read the Bible because I can read you the Bible and the scripture that goes with this, which is Daniel, Daniel chapter 3. But unless you kind of know like all the, the people, it won't, probably won't make a lot of sense. But I'm going to go on and break it down as best I can with this narrative in the sermon. So basically this setup is from Daniel chapter 3. And there was a king back then and his name was King Nebuchadnezzar. And he wanted everybody to worship him. He was king. He wanted them to see him as a god. So the name of this sermon was Sounds Like a Setup. So basically, King Nebuchadnezzar has set up a golden image of himself to be worshipped. Um, it was 90 feet high, um, 9 feet wide, and it was just basically a big old golden statue of him. All right, let's get on into this premises of this sermon. The enemy will set you up to destroy you. But God will show up and mess up the enemy's plans against you. And basically, this was about, uh, there was uh, three uh, Hebrew boys that had been captured or whatever. And Nebuchadnezzar had set up this big old golden idol image of himself where everybody had to worship it. And they said, no, we will not. We will not eat your food and we will not serve your God. We won't. So basically, King Nebuchadnezzar was like, well, are going to throw him up into the fiery furnace. Because back then, they had a big old furnace and anything they wanted to destroy, they just tossed you in there. So the three Hebrew boys were like, nope, we're not going to serve your God. We will not eat your food. We will not bow down to no golden statue. We just ain't going to do it. And they were like, well, we're going to throw you all in the fiery furnace. So they were like, okay, do what you must do with us then because we're not going to do it. So that's the premise or the background of the uh, scripture. All right, so here it is. The enemy will set you up to destroy you, but God will show up and mess up the enemy's plans against you. A seducing strategy. This is what the enemy does. A seducing strategy. The enemy will set up anything in your life to rival God idolatry basically idolatry is anything that involves more of your time or focus from god it's meant to pervert your faith then you spend time on things that you can see and you have to have more faith on whom you cannot see which is god we have to learn to be faithful to something that we cannot see which is god Read Psalms 115 verses 3 through 8 about idols. Basically, y'all, this is what Psalms 115 verses 3 through 8 says. No power, no presence, can't hear your prayers, can't come see about you when you're in trouble. So they have these idols that they would make out of wood and gold and stone. And they would put little ears on them and, you know, little noses and, you know, eyes and all that. But. They could not hear. They were made of wood. They could not speak. They were made of stone. They could not come see about you when you needed help or hear your prayers, even though they had ears and feet on them because they were stone idols, golden idols, wooden idols. They couldn't do anything for you. Examples, modern day. Eve, with Adam and Eve. Eve saw the tree. It looked good to her. That's what the seducing strategy does. You see it. You smell it. You taste it. Eve was the first one. She saw the tree. It looked good to her. 
So she looked at it. Oh, it looks good. God had already told her, do not touch the tree of life or eat of the tree of life. So that's how the seducing enemy comes. Man and woman, we see somebody cute and fine out there. Now, this is what the pastor said. I'm reading these notes. We see somebody cute and fine. You say, ooh, he fine. Ooh, she built. <laughs> I laughed out. No, I was like, "Woo, Pastor, you right." They be out there looking cute and fine, don't they? Don't they? My pastor's real, y'all. He breaks it down with the scriptures. Then he break it down into the modern day, where even if you like of age, you know, a teenager or older, which our teenagers in our church go to a separate church upstairs, so they can be like, you know, more on their little learning level and things that the pastor need to break down. But he broke it down. You see somebody cute and fine, okay? TV commercials, they give you a 30-second clip of food or something that looks good and you want to go buy it or have it. And that's sure enough true. Like when they showing these chicken sandwiches out here and this BK burger, you look at this burger and say, Lord, that look good. I'm going to get it. And you do go get it. People are fighting and killing people over right now in the news over this sandwich. So the enemy always has a seducing strategy. And he uses and sets up anything in your life to rival God or have you to focus on it more than you do on God. Okay. Now, I got to turn the page. Hold on. I'm sorry. The pastor gave us a word yesterday. It was called invidious. Invidious. And it means jealous. The enemy is jealous. The enemy comes at you just because he's not you. The enemy comes just to disrupt you because he knows God is getting ready to elevate you and continue to use you. So you're a target. The enemy is like, I don't think so. I'm going to come up in there and use everything on them I got. If it's drugs, alcohol, madness, eating, adultery, homosexual whatever he got he go up in there and just disrupt it and those things when i name them all it's not passing judgment it is in the bible that those things that you know i named off the alcohol the drugs the homosexuality adultery uh idolatry all of that is in the bible and there's a specific scripture that does say that if you have that you will not see god and let me tell you something when you get saved by god and i want to stress this Yes, God hates those things. And there's a scripture in the Bible that says that if you have it, you will not see God. But in the new reading, basically it says through mercy, grace, and seen through the eyes of God, you are seen in righteousness. So that means God don't want you to live in that life anymore. You know, the life of sinful things. But by Jesus Christ dying on the cross and taking it to God, guess what? You are seen in righteousness. You ask to, for forgiveness and you go for it. So you are seen in righteousness. So guess what? Then that means that you do get to see God. So that's what that means. So when I'm on here and I'm saying that of the Bible, that's not saying, oh, if you're doing that, you're going straight to hell. No, because we are seen in God's righteousness. We ask for forgiveness and we repent. And then we go forward and we respect God. And then because we are seen and saved, because God saved us already on the cross. If Jesus had not sa sent his son and saved us on the cross, then yes, we would be not seeing the face of God. But because Jesus died on the cross for our sins, guess what? You are cleansed of that. You cleansed and you seen in the righteousness of God. So I wanted to stress that. I wanted to stress that you're cleansed of that. Even if you're still struggling with it right now, like I struggle, you know, with my alcoholism or whatever. I know that in the red blood of Jesus that died on the cross, I'm already cleansed of that. And that's why I can go forth and still serve in the kingdom now like I'm, I'm trying my best to do. And I know that in God's due time that I will be delivered here on earth and if not in the kingdom. So, hey, you ain't got to beat yourself up over your struggles because Jesus already repented for those sins in a horrible way. Died for our sins, rather. 
in a horrible way because Jesus had no sin. He took all of our sins. So you you don't have to worry about that no more. Just give that to God because God sees you in your righteousness through what Jesus did on the cross for us so that you can see Jesus now. Because, hey, I want to see him too. I'm, I'm doing my best I can, you know, right now. But forgiven and by the grace of God. Jesus paid for those sins so we get to see Jesus' face. All right, let's keep going. To resist the evil, you must have a stubborn faith. Decide to live right, not like the standards of society. Don't just go with the crowd. Example, you see everybody running and you start running too. Now, golly, <laughs> that's another truth. Been there doing that one. You see others running and you don't know what's happening, but you run too. <laughs> too real. Don't just go with the crowd. Be nonconformist. Stand up for God. Do not bow down to sin. All right. All right. Let me catch up. I lost my wording here. God will deliver us. God is able. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three boys that were shut up in the furnace, they were delivered because there was reflected. it was reflected in their behavior, reflected in their belief, and reinforced in their brotherhood, reflected in their behavior because they said, no, we're not going to eat your foods, reflected in their belief, no, we will not serve no golden image of a man. Reinforced in their brotherhood because they stayed together and they said we will all be here and uh, our God will deliver us. Basic, bold, and but. So you got to have a basic belief, a bold belief, and a but belief. And your but belief means but belief. If God don't change it. He still is able and knows what's best for me. So that's your basic belief. If God don't change it, doesn't matter. He still is able to change it and he knows what's best for me. All right. You will see a supernatural ending for your story. I claim it now and I've seen it. The purpose for the furnace that you go through because the boys were still, were still thrown into the fiery furnace. Once they were in the fiery furnace, the people they first of all they turned the furnace up even hotter because they were like, Well, they won't bow down to Nebu King Nebuchadnezzar, they won't eat the food. They saying they gonna burn up. Go on turn it up that furnace up even hotter. Make sure they burn up. Guess what? There's a purpose for the furnace you're in. The fire that the young boys were in burned up the people that threw them in. Because they turned it up so high, they were like, Make sure they don't come out. There is a purpose for the furnace. The fire burned up the people that threw them in. God will loose you of some stuff while you're in the furnace. Lord, so true. They saw a fourth person in the fire. God will get in the furnace with you. In the preface of the scripture, they were like, didn't y'all put three boys in there? But we saw four walking around. That fourth one was Jesus Christ. God will get in the furnace with you. Everybody should serve the God. And this is what they said when those boys walked out without being burned, didn't smell like smoke, didn't look like smoke. Everybody that was serving King Nebuchadnezzar said, everybody should serve the God that the three boys serve. If God can bring them out of that, he can turn mine around too. And that is my final um, preface for this word today. And y'all, this one is great as usual Live by these um, rules and teachings and hearings of the Lord. Because once you start living it, and I, and I keep saying, read that Bible. Read your Bible. And even if you don't understand it, God will send you something supernatural or somebody supernatural to break it down to you, a minister, somebody. And once you start reading and seeing what it really means, you can apply it to your life. You know, if you feel like you're in a furnace right now, you know, you're like, God, I can't make it through this. Oh, yeah, there's a God that I truly serve that I have seen myself can bring you and show you miracles to where you know uh, the only way that happened. That has to be God that I'm praying to because you ain't told nobody. You ain't said nothing to your family. You ain't said nothing to no friends, no co-workers, nothing. And you see stuff in your life going on. You're like, 
that's God. That's Jesus. So that's it. All right, you guys, I hope you enjoyed it. And like I said, this is a sermon notes from yesterday on Sunday. Today is Veterans Day, and um, I'm not going to make a separate vet, uh, Veterans Day video. I just want to tell everybody that's watching this, thank you for your service, and thank you for going on out there and um, serving in the military and helping people. And um, that's a blessing right there. That gets me a little emotional. It's a lot. Because they showed uh, some airmen that were African-American that I watched this morning that I've never seen in my life. And they actually showed one that had been, um, what you call that, when they capture um, prisoner of war, POW. I've never seen an African-American POW in my life, but I live here in Dallas, Texas, and I was watching the news this morning. And they showed an African-American prisoner of war. And he lives in Atlanta, Georgia now. And I was like, wow. And he just really touched my heart because I'm seeing a man that looks like me that was a, a prisoner of war. And they've never shown that ever. I've never seen it in a museum, never heard it on History Channel. But they showed it on uh, my news channel in Dallas today. And that just touched me. So everybody that served in our country. So, all right, you guys, enjoy your day. And I hope you enjoyed this word too. And I hope you have a wonderful, beautiful, and blessed day. Veterans Day and Day in the Lord. All right.